Bright Ideas is a very innovative project that we've launched here at Avon and Wiltshire Mental Health Partnership Trust. And it enables service users and their carers, as well as our members of staff, to try something new, to see how it is they can improve the service. And actually what we want to get out of it is that co-production where we have a member of staff working very closely with a carer or a service user, understanding how the service can be made better, and to develop a project which promotes hope, encourages recovery. Do you want to tell me how the idea um, came to start the Recovery Peer project? Um, I think it was born out of my own experience of uh, being on a psychiatric ward. I found that uh, as I got more well, as I was recovering while I was on the ward, that I was getting bored. And, um, and when the Bright Ideas initiative was actually rolled out and, and, I, th and I took the idea of, of boredom and I assumed that other service, service users must have felt similarly. You know, that as you start to recover, you want to start doing things. And because I'd always been interested in creative writing, I think I thought it would be a good combination to to tackle boredom at the same time as giving people the opportunity to say something or write something about themselves. Often people will be on the ward. It might be noisy. It might be hectic. They might be affected by the medication that they're on. Their mental illness might restrict them from recalling... Um, certain aspects of their life. It gives people a chance to come down and have some quiet space, come off the ward, think about what helps them to recover. So um, this is something that Karen uh, got her hands on. It's called uh, Letters to My Future Self. You did. Writing a letter to your younger self offering advice, mm. or writing a letter to your not so well self yeah. from your well self. Yeah, and I think it's giving that people the chance to work through from a position of maybe being quite florid and psychotic and unwell to a point where they say something lucid and to, to get to that point of insight. I think there's nothing more powerful with mental illness than having insight into it. So I just thought I'd show you this um, magnetic poetry set that we use um, in the writing sessions. It makes it quite fun and interactive with people because they can have uh, problems thinking of words themselves, so it makes just things much more instant. Pulling out one word and then that might spark a story or a memory. Because when, if you have an illness, maybe some, some of the given meanings for words change for you which is no reason why they shouldn't then write those words down and try and think about what they mean. Because if we get better service user involvement in designing the things that help them to have uh, hope and help them to recover, then you have a marvellous project. Yeah, climbing I felt was a really good way of getting people to have some more confidence because you can't get to the top one week, next week you've made progress and it's, it's quite visual and easy to, to grasp on. Since I've been a service user, really, I've had quite a bit more free time because, because they took me out of work. It's a bit of a physical workout and a bit of a challenge. It means an enjoyable use of time. It, it, it started off as a personal thing for me because I'm, I'm scared of heights, so I had a go at climbing just to, to see what it's like and try and overcome the fear. A couple of my service users that I was working with um, sort, of like, sort of like showed an interest, so they come with us. And over time, we discovered it, it was a, a really good way to um, teach people to, to mindfulness, you know, being in the moment. Also, how to overcome their fears. Because anecdotally, when people climb, they tend not to get the experiences of voice hearing, which is really quite powerful. In my opinion, you know, the reason why we're doing the group. Um, to help people manage their psychotic illness. So when we heard about Bright Ideas, um, 
we decided that the people were going to, or they decided they wanted a uh, climbing qualification, which is a, uh, called the Climbing Wall Award, which is a nationally recognised um, qualification, which isn't cheap. It really wasn't easy. You know, it's not a dead set pass. You know, they have to work for it. And if they don't do the requisite, you know, amount of climbs or groups, then, you know, they can't pass. Because I, I think, you know, it's very undermining, very demoralising to just be given a qualification. It means nothing, doesn't it? You are doing the training? Yeah, I did, yeah. I think it's awesome. I think giving people that opportunity opens up a whole avenue. You can take it to something you're just proud of doing, or you can even move on to, to make it into a job for yourself, which is, which is great. Um, and again, that process is getting you out and taking responsibility for yourself and organising these kinds of things as well. Um, which for, for a lot of people, that's, that's another step um, for, for sort of getting out into the world. I would love when the um, chaps qualify for them to, to roll this out to other teams. I think that this is an innovative, I can't say that word. Innovative. Approach to, um, to healthcare, which is actually led by not just me, but, you know, the people in the group. So it's a real collaborative approach right from the start then? Well, isn't recovery, you know, so I, I can't see that it, it, what we works any other way. Charitable funding has allocated some money toward it. And I think last year or the year before last, 2014, we had £25,000 that would enable us to encourage service users and our staff to develop some initiatives. And I think they've turned out tremendously well. People who have autism have uh, significant sensory uh, challenges and difficulties. There's a research that talks about there being a traffic jam of information involved um, in that instance and it's, it's very much about trying to get things to slow down and support the person to be able to work out what's happening. So the idea of a sensory assessment is you assess what those differences from the norm are and then you try and find ways to address those and, and make the person more comfortable and more able to function. And the evidence suggests that if you find the right piece of kit for that person, that their distress reduces really. For example, somebody uh, might find the fact that there's too much, too much noise or too much input coming in, that might need controlling. So for example, there could be some um, headphones, some noise reduction headphones, to prevent too much stimuli from coming in. It might be, for instance, that they haven't got enough stimulus coming their way and they feel very agitated or anxious. They might need something quite calming and relaxing, like a weighted blanket, for example, or some sort of relaxation equipment. The, the ideas that we have, the things that we think will work for them, aren't actually the best solution. So the idea was to create a literal library of things that we can lend to people and then uh, they can just try them on for size, really. The, the person will be identified that they have some sensory needs and challenges that need assessing and then a member of staff is able to then go and borrow the piece of equipment and then that will go out to the service user with a service user agreement and instructions etc. This project is about getting equipment to give to people with autism and it's about finding a resource that isn't available and sharing it with service users and I think that's a model we can replicate very easily across masses of different wards and team types. We work with um, deaf people who have complex mental health needs and um, as part of our kind of day-to-day -day work we meet deaf people who really struggle to access any information in English. It's very much a second language um, and yet, on a day-to-day -day basis, lots of the information that we routinely give out to patients is in English, and it's often not the simplest English either. 
we were talking about the, the application process, we realised there were lots of hearing people who didn't understand the barriers that deaf people have to face every day and go through. So when we asked for funding, we had to talk about my own experience, my experience of all the barriers that I faced. Mm -hmm. So they had to understand that with us, and things had to become BSL accessible, British Sign Language accessible for them. So we needed to make sure that the, in the 21st century, so we had to make sure the deaf people were aware of what was out there, what's out there for the deaf community. Um, you know, so if they were, because deaf people don't know about PALS, for instance, so we had to, you don't know how to you know, book, make an appointment, or talk about your rights, having access to various different services out there, so they weren't aware of all of this. BSL Space um, is a web page on our space where we have over about 40 pages of information in English that's been translated into lots of different sign language clips and is becoming a kind of virtual community um, in terms of being a focus point for different information about health, links to um, Facebook pages, that, a Facebook page that looks at um, deaf health and wellbeing um, and signpost people to other sources of information. So that's a resource both for service users um, and for professionals who want to work with deaf people. So just some simple changes that can be make and make it think easier for everyone, um, just for everyone, not just the deaf community. As well. After the funding was allocated, we enabled each of the successful bids to have some training to make sure that the projects were actually implemented. Each of the projects in Bright Ideas had a mentor attached to it. The mentor was able to be there to help them navigate through that system, provide that help and that guidance to make sure that our projects were able to be completed. I think I was very lucky because I think the group of young people, the young carers um, that our staff were working with were very keen to take the project and run with it themselves, which is absolutely how we wanted it to be. I was really there to be a sounding board and if they got into any kind of, not problem really, but challenge I suppose in, in how to get round something, I was there. I care for my mum, um, who, who suffers from mental illness, and um, yeah, I've been caring for the past 12 years now. Young people that are going through school, which is really hard, like doing GCSEs, A-levels, with having that caring role, and you need that time to study, but you can't. The last statistic was, I think, there are a quarter of a million young carers in the UK, and only 1% of those are registered as young carer with their GPs. Young people, during a crisis generally have a better understanding of what's going on than we give them credit for. It's quite hard for a health professional to um, come forward and see a, a young child and then, um, and then to know what to say to that young person, especially if they're not able to offer anything themselves. So we want to reach those young people that um, don't really know which way to turn and, and possibly don't even know they have this caring role or if they're any different to any other young person. Um, and actually it's letting them know, look, you're not alone. Um, these responsibilities are, are heavy and, and you need support with that. And actually involve and include, rather than kind of all the mental health professionals who come around, you better go and hide in your bedroom and don't come out until they've gone sort of thing, which unfortunately still happens even today. The, the purpose would be to, to reach as many young people as possible with some information and, um, and something that can be fun and start a conversation um, with health professionals. Um, the idea of having a rucksack that has um, not only leaflets about local services that the young person can reach out to, but also things that can be fun that they can do with their parent or um, with a carer or, or anybody to really start a conversation. And also um, we're going to go into the, the mental health ward and, um, and the crisis team and train them not only what this rucksack can provide a young person but also um, what a young carer is, uh, what that means for a young person and what it means to their family. They, they've been able to achieve so much so I'm really pleased to have been part of this. It's nice to see that some of your colleagues are fired up about the work they're doing and want to do it better. 
So what was nice was that we kind of thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could just, and actually we really could do that. I, I would like to see it kind of take off and progress and maybe be something that the Trust will look at back in 10 years and kind of think, how did we not do that? If something works and it's of benefit to service users in that team, it should then naturally be able to expand without being too difficult. I would encourage people to think about a little bit of blue sky thinking, but kind of just think about the things they could do if, if there were no barriers for, you know, small projects, but if, if there were no barriers. So I'd like to, you know, roll it out across the trust, then take over the world. <laughs>